Hi, I'm Mark Madison, the historian for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and today I'm here with Jonathan Waterman. John is here to talk about his new book, Atlas of Wild America, to give a talk to the students that are out here and those who can view it later in the week. Uh, and Atlas of Wild America is the second in a trilogy. Um, tell us a little about the first book. First book was Atlas of the National Parks. It came out three years ago and uh, uh, is a compendium of uh, the 61 national parks that existed in several years ago. They're now 63, so we're going to have to do a new edition. <laughs> but it's uh, proved to be a very popular book uh, and it's paved the way for this second volume, Atlas of Wild America. Now, a lot of Americans are going to think Wild America is in the national parks. How does this differ? Yeah, it, and it's a good question. The, most or many national parks have legislated wilderness areas within them. Uh, so uh, wilderness, however, is, uh, exists also in uh, national wildlife refuges, on BLM land, and on Forest Service land. So there are four federal agencies that manage wilderness areas. So it gave me a lot of room to choose from. And in addition to a couple of non-national park, but park service managed units, preserves uh, and, uh, that I chose from in the book, uh, I included uh, wildlands within all the other federal agencies too. And do you want to give us a preview of the third book, or are you superstitious and want to keep that close to the vest? Uh, Authors go both ways here, the, so well, no third, judgment. The third book is a completely different subject. The third book is a, uh, a history of America, beginning with the Bering Land Bridge till uh, right up to the, the modern pandemic. It's a, a massive book uh, and, and a, a huge research project. I don't know how I'd do it all without a the team at National Geographic, the cartographers and editors whom I work with. It's kind of an interesting title, Atlas of Wild America. Generally, we think of atlases as maps and so on. What, is, what does atlas mean in the context of the two books you've finished? Well, there, there are over 250 maps in each of the mm -hmm. previous two atlases. So there is a lot of map content. Um, and uh, almost as many maps as photographs, or over 300 photographs in the new book, too. And there's no shortage of text. I think it's, a, uh, you know, over 90,000 words, not counting captions. So it's a big volume. There's a lot of work. The, the most recent book really essentially took me two years to, to write, but really I, it, a lifetime was spent researching it. Well, let's go back in your biography. You actually have the distinction, John, of being our most common, well, that's a poor term, <laughs> our most prolific public lecture speaker. You've been out here at least four times, if we count this time. You've done a remote public lecture. We've had you out here uh, going back two decades almost. Um, and you started, uh, I think, perhaps the first lecture we might have had you out here for, uh, was your journey across Arctic. Tell us a little about that. That was uh, from a book called Arctic Crossing. Yeah. Uh, that was about my 2200 mile journey, mostly alone across the Arctic. Um, I started in 1997 and finished uh, uh, three years later, but mostly traveled in the summers. I spent a winter uh, living in two different villages just to get the, the hang of things in the far north in the dead of winter when there's no daylight. Um, and it was, a, for me, a, a, a remarkable journey, not so much for the, the, just the physical challenges, but equally for the, the time spent among culture, learning about the Inuit people. It's a great book, and uh, you brought some great video with that when you came out here. But it's interesting. It's rare we have uh, a public speaker out here who lists their occupation as author and adventurer or author and explorer. Uh, how do those two work together? I mean, you're, you're constantly writing in your, your kayak as you traverse the, 
Arctic Ocean, or, or how do you combine those two? Well, I do spend a great deal of time journaling. Uh, every day I try to write in my journal. But the, the, the mix is a little bit odd, even for me, because when I finish these journeys, I then would will typically spend a year behind a computer screen uh, transcribing those journals and uh, researching the places that I've gotten to know and putting it down in something more lyrical and accessible to the public, along with photographs. Do you ever have adventurous remorse and say, oh, wait, I wish I'd taken better notes that day, <laughs> you know, as, I, as I look a year hence? All the time, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that's why I'm glad that I take pictures, because the photographs fill in whatever I miss with the journal. And, you know, if you've had a long day and you're exhausted, it's hard to even write a page in your journal. But I, I do also take photographs every day. And even if they're out of focus or are uh, not well composed, photographs tell a story. Uh, and they you know, resurrect day's events in a way that even the journal doesn't do. So I, I found the camera to be an equally useful tool just for, for the writing later on. We had you also out here for a, a journey you took down the Colorado River called Running Dry. Uh, end up in a book of, of that title. And uh, that seems a particularly appropriate book for climate change. What did you discover as you went down the Colorado River? <laughs> yeah, well, it was an issue then when I went down the river in 2008. And um, it was clear to me that even more than a dozen years ago that there were and are ways that we can conserve water and, and get the river running to the sea again. Uh, but uh, we'd forgotten, and in the intervening dozen years that have passed, we've come back into another exceptionally dry spell, yeah. and the, the, uh, the river is over-allocated in a way that it's never been before, and now those conservation measures are upon us. We have to take action. Um, I, and I think that the, the place to begin is with agriculture. Much of the river goes to, to big agriculture, and if we can enact conservation measures through agriculture, we can keep the river in its riverbed. So you mentioned your third trilogy is going to have a historic slant, small scale from the Bering Land Bridge. <laughs> to the present, uh, but you did have a more focused history book called Surviving Denali. Tell us how you ended up writing that book and what that was about. Well, in some ways, it was my most successful book because uh, I identified an audience right away, uh, and that audience were the potential climbers on Denali. Mm -hmm. The subtitle for Surviving Denali could well be How Not to Kill Yourself on the Mountain. <laughs> And uh, I went to, I was working as a park service ranger at the time. And I went to my boss with the observation that there were patterns behind the accidents on the mountain. And wouldn't it be nice if we could write a book about these accident patterns so that climbers could educate themselves and not repeat the mistakes of their predecessors. And he said, that sounds great. If you can find a publisher, we'll open the files to you and give you a research assistant. Uh, and I did find a, a small press publisher and spent that winter after the mountaineering season ended writing the book. And it's been in print now for 40 years this year. Uh, and easily my most successful book, not in terms, certainly not in terms of sales, but mm -hmm. in terms of actually saving uh, probably a f more than a few lives and uh, reducing the number of accidents. Of course, that leads to the question, what are some of the top two or three tips to survive Denali? <laughs> uh, acclimatization is uh, top of the list. Some people just climb the mountain too quickly and get sick and contract various type of altitude sickness. Uh, uh, cerebral edema is a very rare altitude sickness that will generally kill 
a person every year or two on the mountain when their brain fills with fluid. Mm -hmm. Pulmonary edema is a more common, high altitude pulmonary edema is a lot more common. Uh, and uh, then, of course, there's a, uh, what we call AMS, acute mountain sickness, which tends to knock down a lot more people uh, with, uh, with just general lethargy and lack of appetite and fatigue. Uh, doesn't typically kill people, but can make th can lead to mistakes that can actually uh, drop you dead. Let's move to a less dour subject. <laughs> it's my fault for asking you. So, for the Atlas of National Parks, which sits in a proud place on my desk in my home office. Well, thank you. <laughs> Love it. Uh, but did you have to visit every single park? Uh, I would have liked to have visited every single park, and it's an enticement to go visit every park. But my methodology has is, is been different. Um, rather than tagging all of the national parks, I, I tend to have my favorites, and I go back repeatedly and spend long periods of time, in addition to the time spent as a guide and a ranger on Denali, in Denali National Park, um, i particularly fond of the Alaskan National Parks, uh, parks in the, in the desert southwest. Uh, or, uh, Glacier Bay is one of my favorites, but uh, I generally go into these national parks and get off the beaten track pretty quick, uh, off into the backcountry for weeks or even months at a time. Is that how you choose your favorites, the ones that are most remote or offer the most solitude? Uh, well, I would have to say that's true, that Gates of the Arctic is the least visited national park of them all, and that's yeah. the one that I've probably spent as much time in as, as any park. We talked earlier about surviving Denali um, before we went on the air, uh, and how that had a, a focus and kind of a focused audience to a certain extent. People that climb or are interested in climbing. Who is your audience? Your books seem to run a pretty wide gamut of, of topics. Who, who are That's you writing for? That's a great for? question, and, and I should be asking that all the time. Uh, in, of course, for the national parks, it was quite simple. There are mm -hmm. many, many park lovers out there. For this new book that just came out last week, the Atlas of Wild America, I'm writing for a less defined audience, um, and, and I'm hopefully uh, reaching out to educate people about what wilderness is and what its value to us is as a society, and why we need more of it, and why we need to keep extractive industries away from these wilderness areas, not necessarily from within the boundaries, but even from outside the boundaries. Uh, so. Uh, I'm reaching broader for this wilderness subject with Atlas of Wild America and trying to find a, uh, probably the same audience interested in national parks would gravitate to this. We're on the eve of the 60th anniversary of the Wilderness Act in mm -hmm. 2024. The Wilderness Act was signed in 1964 by President Johnson. and. Uh, I'm hoping that it'll bring a lot more attention to our wildlands, uh, which are not nearly as well funded as our national parks. Well, they don't have a separate system, right? There's, there's a, a national wilderness preservation system superposed <laughs> on the parks and, and, and refuges. Four and, different and, agencies, yeah. Yeah, yeah, which is different. Well, we're big fans of the Wilderness Act. One of our former employees largely wrote it, Howard Zahnheiser. We have one of the pens LBJ used to sign it. Oh, so really? we're, huh? we're, we'll be celebrating next year for the anniversary too. I kind of jokingly said, you've been the author to visit us the most. You've been the speaker to come out here the most. And, and even today, we're doing this broadcast, this added bonus content. You're giving a, a lecture tonight to the public uh, we're rebroadcasting this. We're doing a podcast with this right after. You actually, um, John, work really hard uh, to reach people with your work. And I can tell you from having about 100 different authors out here, um, you are, are probably the best at, at reaching out and seeking those opportunities. And I appreciate that. Usually I have to 
beg authors to come out and they're busy or I'm writing another book. You actually um, seem to seek out audiences and, and public speaking. What do you what do you get out of that having live audiences? Well, you know, part of the the challenge in being a writer is that by necessity you spend a tremendous amount of time isolation yeah. behind a, a computer screen, which is so antithetical to the work that I, I do, you know, out in the wilderness, in the wilds, totally unplugged. Um, but then the, the isolation, sort of the double isolation, uh, can be quite uh, stymieing. Yeah. So I find that getting out and talking in front of people is a way to relieve that uh, isolation, uh, as well as share my work. And, and a lot of my work has an advocacy component to it. I want people to advocate for wilderness and national parks and saving wild places and animals. Uh, so the more people I can speak to above and beyond uh, small but growing readership, uh, the more successful I'll be in my mission of advo advocacy and affecting change. That's a great way to go out. We're happy we've been the beneficiary <laughs> of your desire to connect uh, with your audience and be an effective advocate for national parks, wildlands, and, and our environment as a whole. So thank you, John. Yeah, thank we you. It's always it. a pleasure. Come always here. a pleasure on our end, too. Thanks. Thank you for coming tonight. Some of you might be familiar with my last work, Atlas of the National Parks. It was an engaging project that I did for the National Geographic, one of several I've done over the last couple of decades. And some of you may also know that the National Parks have wilderness areas within them. Uh, which brings me to my latest project, the Atlas of Wild America which is uh, exclusively about wild places. So this is the second of three atlases I'm working on. And this is the subject of my talk this evening, specifically about wild places and wilderness across the continent, including Mexico and Canada. Who is that person? That's from more than 40 years ago, and I was already 10 years into uh, these immersive experiences that I like to do in wild places. But what is wilderness? I want to try and, and get our arms around it this evening. No place can truly be called wilderness. It's kind of a slippery term. It is more a feeling about undeveloped landscapes, a subjective and often elusive state of mind. Wild places uh, like these 41 areas in my book, from the, the Noatak National Preserve in the hinterlands of Alaska here in the Arctic, all the way down to Okefenokee in southern Georgia and northern Florida. Th these wild places are essential amid population growth, the diminished natural habitat, and the adjacent development and mineral exploitation that are rampant on this continent. One of the first wild places I sought out repeatedly as a teenager was here in Baxter State Park. And for the book, we found the most beautiful images that we could that spoke to how we respond both emotionally and spiritually to wilderness. And for each of the chapters, I found a quote that, that uh, tried to get into the pulse of what wilderness is. And here we have Henry David Thoreau, who had actually was a, visited this place more than 150 years ago, who wrote, from the forest and wilderness come the tonics and barks which brace mankind. A great starter, I think, to define what wilderness is. Well, for me, in my early days, I took to wilderness really as a challenge, as many people do when they're young. I chose this photo of Baxter State Park on Mount Katahdin because my early trips there were in the wintertime. I was interested in winter mountaineering and climbing in the great ranges in the world. We're looking across at a, a famous place. Any of you that are from New England know that this is the Knife Edge, uh, and this is Pomola Peak. It's a, 
a route that you take uh, to the main peak. In the book, I, I wrote about um, my experience there in these journal-like entries that are in many of the chapters. And on July, or rather December 29th, 1974, I wrote, as I clambered slowly across the spine of a mountain sharpened by the last ice age, I focused on each footstep. Inches to the right, frosted slabs dropped more than a thousand feet to Chimney Pond. Then my partner yelled, pointing left, the Brock Inspector. We'd been engulfed in mist and the sun cast her clearly to find shadows surrounded by strange rainbow halos onto a thick cloud bank in front of us. We lofted our ice axes to the sky in jubilation. So for the book, I chose those places I really wanted to go to, uh, as well as those places I got to know well, like the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Coincidentally, we're looking at the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge here in northeastern Alaska on this beautiful mural. Uh, this is Shinjek Lake, a place that I've been able to visit. But since wilderness should be about preserving diverse biosystems, I also chose more accessible places like the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge in Georgia. And rather than stand here and try to tell you my what I think wilderness is, what it means to me. I, I often turned on my video camera and asked strangers and friends alike, and turned it on myself to try and get to that heart and spirit of what wilderness is. So here's my take on it. I don't know what I would do without wilderness in my life. I, uh, since I was 16 years old, I have taken trips into places that were either legislated wilderness or places where I could go without other people, and without engines and the noise of civilization. So for me, wild places are an antidote to the rest of the world, to the madding throngs of the, of the city or the pressures of the career. Uh, here I, I, I find a sense of sanity, a sense of belonging. Uh, so I also chose and visited uh, many arid places. I'm very fond of the Southwest. I live in the Southwest. And here you can see Mary Austin's definition of wilderness. For all the toll the desert takes of a man, it gives compensations, deep breaths, deep sleep, and the communion of the stars. And of course, I went to these places like Mojave that I hadn't been to before and wandered uh, looking for the desert tortoise, one of the primary residents of the Mojave National Preserve in Southern California. And I contemplated a recent wildfire, that one of many raging across California because of climate change. It killed uh, thousands and thousands of trees here in the Mojave National Preserve. I found that flying in a small plane was an essential tool to get a better grasp of the wilderness landscape. And I ended up using more than a few of these photos that I took over the last dozen years of flying for the book. This is, these are the amazing Kelso dunes in the Mojave Preserve, a place I've never, I've never heard of these sand dunes before. It's just yet another one of the sort of hidden treasures in our wildlands across the, the country. Or it's lava domes. I've learned that when you get up in the air, you can actually get a real sense for, for time uh, and the passage of time among, through the millennia, uh, the volcanoes and the lava flows that rent this landscape so many years ago, something that you can't quite see from the ground. I spent a lot of time flying uh, this particular pilot uh, out of Bozeman, Montana, uh, who was also a photographer, insisted that he take the door off the plane. Uh, so I, I thought it would be, make for good, better pictures, but uh, his only safety device was, was duct tape over my seatbelt. So I tried to lean left every time I took a photograph, and he banked like this. I flew with another uh, 
now friend, uh, Stephen, Dr. Stephen Meyer out of uh, Grand Junction, who insisted that we fly with oxygen, which was fine with me because we were often flying above 14,000 feet when we flew the high peaks of Colorado. And one of my favorite pilots, a man who, when I last flew him, was uh, 84 years old. Uh, we always flew out of his hometown, of Phoenix, Arizona, and we always left before dawn so we could get down to Mexico just as a So these are the incredible volcanic remnants in El Picante Biosphere Reserve along the, the southern border of Arizona in Mexico. It's a place that the Apollo astronauts trained in because of their resemblance to the moon craters. And it happens to be one of the driest places on Earth. The, the Biosphere Reserve uh, is right there against the border wall and the border fence. And we flew back and forth. And, that, the, the right-hand side or the north side of the border fence there adjoins uh, two different protected areas in the states, the Cabeza Prieta National Wildlife Refuge and uh, Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument. And I was actually flying the border fence in hopes that I could find a herd of this animal, the pronghorn, which is known as the desert ghost, uh, nearly wiped out in part because of that uh, fence there that prevents it from migrating back and forth. But the, I'm pleased to report that they are about to remove the species from the endangered species list. Or then there's Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore, uh, a place run by the Park Service. And I chose this and went there and explored it a bit because uh, the place has legislated wilderness within it and it's up against the shore of Lake Superior admittedly a, an oceanic lake of, of all lakes. You can see the quote from Henry Schoolcraft from about 200 years ago. We were wholly unprepared to encounter the surprising groups of overhanging precipices, towering walls, caverns, waterfalls, and prostrate runes mingled in with a most wonderful disorder. And this photograph that we chose here shows you why uh, they named it Pictured Rocks. Because this book is a work of uh, maps and it's an atlas, uh, I had the pleasure of looking for and, and finding lots of different maps that showed different scientific aspects rather than just ordinary maps. And here we, we chose a map. I, had, I worked with a team of cartographers at the National Geographic. We chose a map that shows the bathymetry and the the temperature changes in Lake Superior and the other Great Lakes over the year to give the broader picture and the science behind what's happening there. And when I visited Pictured Rocks, I turned on my video camera and pointed it at my friends. Ralph, tell me what wilderness means to you. Uh, it's an opportunity to unplug from uh, society and uh, from other people. And I think the the quality of uh, um, quietude, uh, the soughing of the winds in the treetops, the twitter and bark of squirrels and birds, and um, the general, actually, exposure to the elements, the, the lack of protection of societies and the need to rely on your own resources to survive and uh, endure. Ducare is vincere to endure is to conquer. I chose and visited Upper Missouri River Breaks National Monument. It's a, administered by the Bureau of Land Management in Montana, here in the headwaters of the Missouri River. Uh, first visited by white men in 1805 by Meriwether Lewis and, and Clark when uh, he put his handle on what might have been the, the 
the purest wilderness in North America, at least at the time, and wrote in his journal, as we passed on, it seemed as if those scenes of visionary enchantment would never end. And after becoming deliriously excited of reading their journals, I had the pleasure of going and camping in exactly those spots that they camped in, in the headwaters there along the Missouri. And although there is there are cows grazing along the banks of the Big Muddy, and it's not my ideal of a wilderness area, there are what they call wilderness study units within this piece of land that eventually could be legislated as true, fully protected wilderness without motorized vehicles and, and hopefully without cows. Another friend of mine, Maddie Howard, uh, defined wilderness for me after a 10-day trip in the northern Alaskan wilderness. I think for me it's just a, it's a place where I can reset. And all your priorities change, the things that you're thinking about change. Um, and you get to elevate nature and the outdoors over people instead of trying to elevate people over our natural landscape. spoken quite truly as the mosquitoes are hounding her. I think it's different for all of us. Um, but in 1964, this is how it was defined uh, in the verbiage of the Wilderness Act. A wilderness is hereby recognized as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. I'm going to come back to that. I want to think about that untrammeled. So there were more than 50 wilderness areas created uh, with the signing of that Wilderness Act in 1964 by President Johnson. It took 66 drafts to finish that six-page piece of legislation. And those wilderness areas contained over 9 million acres and most of them are close to motorized vehicle use and timber harvest and grazing and mining activity or any other development. To date, more than 800 wilderness areas have been created, not only on Forest Service land, but in wildlife refuge, refuges, uh, Bureau of Land Management areas, and in national parks. So it's an amazing resource, and um, it's something that you can't really find in the rest of the world. Long before the Wilderness Act, nearly 40 years ago, 40 years before the Wilderness Act, it started with the father of American wilderness, Aldo Leopold. Back to the definition of wilderness, uh, Leopold once wrote that wilderness is the one kind of playground which mankind cannot build to order. And in 1924, he persuaded the Forest Service to create the world's first wilderness area, the Gila Wilderness, three quarters of a million acres in New Mexico. We're looking straight down in this National Geographic photo on the Gila River, which is sort of one of the, the beauties of the Gila Wilderness. I spent several days running that river and listening to the wolves there. I also spent time flying in New Mexico, a place that is like California, frequently ravaged by wildfires, and this is a, a, a big wildfire several years ago, uh, creeping out of the Aldo Leopold wilderness and into the Gila wilderness, and its tendrils are reaching down the valley. There's no reason to leave out Canada in a book about wilderness, a country that arguably has more wild areas than we do, certainly in the lower 48 anyways. And I was particularly drawn to Mount Logan. It's the largest mountain massif in the world uh, with eight summits rising out of this, this extraordinary high altitude plateau here. For the book, I chose a quote from one of the first ascensionists, a man named Fred Lambert, who wrote, you can just barely make that out there probably, we are in real peril. He wrote in his journal that year, 1925, burrowing like a bunch of rabbits because they were caught in a storm just below the summit. 
I first went to Mount Logan in 1978, and we were the first to climb this knife edge ridge, uh, the west ridge. We didn't see another person for 30 days on this, uh, the wildest of all places on the continent, a beautiful ridge. These pictures make you think that it's just uh, lovely, lovely sunshine all the time, but in fact, it's one of the stormiest mountains I've ever been on. But I had the opportunity to return to Mount Logan a dozen years later uh, with my own team of dogs. This is from a, a champion sled dog team that had won the Iditarod the year before, and I followed in the trail of an Iditarod musher in order that um, we reenact what the pioneers, what Fred Lambert had done in 1925. They had come in with dogs as well. So I think that this is yet another way, or at least it has been for me, another way it's to understand to wilderness is to follow the trail like of our predecessors to see how it changed their lives. Those men and uh, we did make a hardships. film that year in 1990 back, about our trip spring, to Mount Logan, and I've cut this film to, uh, to this no shot of me standing on one of those eight sure summits. The, the cinematographer was a couple thousand feet below. Several times the effort. Uh, so share that film. The greatest tour de force in the history of mountaineering, the 1925 ascent of Mount Logan. It had long been my dream to follow in the footsteps of these men. I believe every mountaineer can find tremendous inspiration in the pioneer's sacrifice and commitment. So what we have accomplished is not so much a mountaineering feat, but a celebration of those who came before us. How you doing, John? I never rode a boat in my life. Well, I can tell you how to do it. Just keep it in the middle. Uh, and it used to run into, as you may know, it used to run into the delta, but no longer reaches the delta. And I know that it's a personal thing, but for me, that uh, the luxury of being able to spend five months and really getting to know the river, paddling it from source to sea, is uh, really the way to get to know a wild place. Yet it was a grand disappointment to see the river end in this uh, terrible, polluted Frappuccino pit just a few miles south of the border where we began walking. This was an incredible place, a place of seemingly infinite sky, despite the fact that the Colorado River ran dry and no longer reaches the sea. There are these extraordinary, strange shapes in the ground that we finally realized were the, these huge high tides that come up during the spring moons and, and bring the, the tidal water up into the, to the riverbed and leave these dendritic shapes. And when I got up in the air and flew, as I repeatedly did over the years, I could suddenly make sense of these alien tidal trees. It was so beautiful. 
could also uh, see uh, the place that I visited on the eastern side of the delta where the water had come back to the delta, a place called Cienega de Santa Clara, a place that is a giant marsh that has attracted all kinds of bird life. And up in the air, it could also capture what an enormous expanse of sky hangs over this truly diverse landscape. And I began thinking of it in different ways. Rather than a wasteland, I found it very beautiful. The father of American wilderness, Leopold, wrote, and maybe you can make it out here if you can. I'll read it. The river was nowhere and everywhere, for he could not decide which of a hundred green lagoons offered the most pleasant and least speedy path to the Gulf. Well, he wrote that uh, just about a hundred years ago. And of course, it's changed a great deal. Uh, for the, the book, I found a map that showed how the Sea of Cortez was created geologically over uh, five million years. But uh, throughout the book, I have uh, these uh, pseudo journal entries that, it, that I call wild memories. And I want to share with you uh, one of my uh, observations from that time I spent in the Delta making my way to the sea. It's really a postmodernistic wilderness experience from that of Leopold 100 years ago. I wrote here briefly nature endured rattling kingfishers, squadrons of circling mallards, and hushed, stern-faced cattle egrets. We could smell the poiscoidal tang of ocean tides. Tamarisk thinned, salt grass bearded the ground. Pindale ducks, curlews, ibis, plovers, and black-crowned night herons fluttered and gabbled and splashed. Sear mountains surrounded us under an infinite sky Bisected by a once unstoppable river that scarcely knew banks. As the stream narrowed, we could feel it gather momentum as if it would once more meet the sea. I didn't have to ask the astute team that I work with at the National Geographic to open the book with this spread of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, which Many people consider the ultimate wilderness as a place, 19 and a half million acres, nearly the size of the state of South Carolina. And one of the maps that we chose for this chapter is one of my favorite maps in the book that shows how the birds that depend upon this refuge and go here to breed and nest and migrate to every year um, are the same birds that we see in our backyard. So if we were to put oil rigs in this refuge, as has been proposed on multiple occasions, we would in fact be killing those birds that pass through our backyards. So this, I know from personal experience, having paddled all the way across the Arctic, that this is the only place in North America, the refuge, where the mountains come so close to the sea. And I've visited it again and again over the years. I've walk through it and paddle its coast and, and run its rivers, uh, sometimes alone, but most often with friends like George Schaller, who's the, really the world's greatest field biologist. And he had this to say about the refuge when we traveled there together in 2000. Area, peaceful mountains, ice, the river bobbing along. What more can you ask for? Clouds moving in from the south, looks very dramatic. And above all, a congenial and good team that all enjoy the same thing. I think everybody should have an experience like that and there wouldn't be any questions about preserving the Arctic refuge. So here you see the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in the northeast corner of Alaska. And on next to it is really the greatest piece of legislative wilderness in all of our country. 
It stretches 13 million acres in the Noatak National Preserve and in uh, gates of the Arctic National Park. And that's over 20,000 square miles, not counting the thousands of square miles adjacent to it that are other uh, park lands or just uninhabited except for all the wildlife, the caribou and the muskox and the wolves and the bird life moving through there. So it's an amazing piece of wilderness. I've repeatedly gone there. Picture from the book of the headwaters of the Noatak River, uh, just above where it meets the Noatak National Preserve. I first went to the Arctic in 1983 on this Park Service patrol. Uh, it was my first time to the Noatak River, uh, and it's when I fell in love with the Arctic and knew that I would have to come back again and again. Uh, I went on a couple more trips, uh, but I didn't return for 36 years, and I took my son back several summers ago to share with him the wilderness values that I'd learned, to share with him what I thought was one of the ultimate wilderness places. And we went the same time of year that I first went uh, nearly 40 years earlier in the first week of August. We went in order to uh, be in a season where there aren't bugs flitting around, uh, where I suspect it was going to be cold, wintry. But you see that my son is in shorts and barefoot, and we went swimming in the river, something that I'd never done several decades ago. The place had completely changed. I was blown away uh, by the changes that I saw, and I'm, I'm going to share with you some of those things. We saw caribou in 1983 all the time in the river that first week of August, being chased by wolves. We found a wolf den. But when I returned several years ago, we only saw one caribou all the way down into the Noatak National Preserve as we floated the river. And it's not just that the numbers have declined, it's that the seasons have lengthened, and so the caribou are migrating much later. You can see here on this fish and wildlife chart uh, that the numbers in 1983 were about uh, 218,000, and they've now dropped to uh, latest census 164,000 from a, from a high of uh, half a million not too long ago. One of the reasons for the caribou decline is the change in lichen growth. They depend on, this, on lichen, particularly down here in their winter range. They migrate up to the foothills of the Arctic every summer, and then they come back down here to the Seward Peninsula. And you see here from this chart that um, the lichen growth has really slowed since 1985. In fact, it's at a negative value versus the green areas where lichen continues to grow. And without lichen, the herd uh, will surely continue to decline. Another reason for the decline of the herd is simply uh, what's causing the decline of caribou across the continent, and that's development, habitat loss. Here in Alaska, that's the recent opening of this area known as Willow, another oil field, is likely to uh, stress the herd in their summer migratory range. Uh, a proposed road into the Ambula Mining District would cut through the southern part of gates of the Arctic National Park, and this road built uh, two decades ago, the Red Dog Mine, a zinc mine, uh, has affected the caribou migration as well. So we have to be ever vigilant, even in these protected wildlands, uh, because if things are done immediately outside these wildlands, uh, it uh, can bring things like the caribou herd into a state of decline. Here from the book, another map that we used you can see the temperature changes over the last half century. There's the no attack preserve there, mislabeled in this particular slide. Uh, but you can see that the temperature has changed more than six degrees Fahrenheit, it has risen, average annual temperature, more than six degrees Fahrenheit in the last half century. And as I observed on that first trip back there, uh, it has wrought massive changes. So I decided to go back 
uh, the summer before last and try to document some of those changes in this ultimate of all wilderness areas. And we put in on the south side of the Brooks Range and cut through the corner of gates of the Arctic National Park here to the headwaters, the very headwaters of the Noatak River, which we would float all 450 miles of to the Inupiat village of Noatak, thence to the coast, and we walked the coast to the village of Kivalina, myself and the photographer. We uh, climbed up the Brooks Range by dragging our rafts and carrying our rafts on our backs up a, a place called Kalulutuk Creek, which anywhere else in the world would be called a river. Take note of these strange landslides on the hillside. I'm going to talk more about those. And after four days, we got to a pass and were able to look down on the magnificent uh, headwaters of the Noatak River. This is what we saw. There. Some other unnamed jagged peaks. It's all around. And the sun has come out. It is just so beautiful up here. It's hard to leave. I don't want to leave. <laughs> but we gotta we gotta go down. We gotta make progress. Gone a long way downstream. Here we go. Headwaters of the no attack. So we walked along that river amid the veritable flower gardens of fireweed and sink foil and uh, boykinia, which is the bear flowers. Uh, the bears like to munch on these things. We, a juvenile wolf came running up to us because it probably never seen a human before. And although people like to float the Noatak River, they don't, no one comes this high because you can't float up here in the headwaters. But that river water is mostly permafrost melt and a little bit of snow fields and a little bit of glacial melt. And after a couple of days, as you can imagine, it increased in flow. And then finally, um, we are uh, just debating whether we should put in. It's lovely to run a river from the source to the sea. It's, uh, it's like I've done this several times with several different rivers, large and small. And it's like making a, a new intimate friend. And finally, we had enough water so that we didn't have to debate anymore pulled out a little nylon sack, which we used as a bellows, and took our nine pound pack rafts out of our packs and blew them up as if we had freeze dried food. And away we went. We're so excited uh, to be finally just cruising down the river instead of slogging along, uh, walking through melted permafrost, bumping off the rocks and these minor rapids. And, just taking in everything that surrounded us. We're so uh, isolated, so alone. What a lovely feeling. This is true wilderness. summer before last was the smokiest summer in Alaska in a long time. Uh, more than two million acres burned throughout Alaska. Uh, and we're often in clouds of smoke like this on this peak that we climbed above uh, the place that other boaters normally put in. This is what it looked like in Alaska in that week that we crossed the headwaters in terms of of carbon monoxide uh, output from those fires. And mind you, fires are extremely rare in the Arctic. In fact, in years past, over the millennia, there simply weren't fires in the Arctic. And this is because of the warming and the drying, of course, in the, our time of climate crisis. 
The vastness of the Arctic draws me back year after year. You look off in the distance, and because there aren't vis the normal visual cues, there aren't buildings, there aren't trees in this part of the Arctic, um, you don't have anything to gauge what you're looking at, and the valleys are incredibly wide. Sometimes you don't know if you're looking at a ground squirrel or a distant grizzly bear. After a week without seeing anyone, we ran into a couple of European uh, fish ecologists, and I thought it was remarkable, and we we're glad to have their company because they were better fishermen than we were, uh, and they were pulling some big salmon out of the river. Um, but what was remarkable, too, was that they'd come from halfway around the world because in Europe, they don't have wild places like this. They don't have salmon in their rivers anymore. So they come from halfway around the world, like us, uh, to revel in this wilderness. So uh, just to, to underscore uh, how uh, lovely it is to have this resource. And in sushi restaurants, this Acura, or red caviar, is over $30 for a tiny serving, but we had all we could eat for free. And we had fish soup as well, heavily laced with chili to keep us warm because it was so cold out. Fish head soup, which the Europeans thought was a delicacy. The Americans, Chris and I, not so much. We saw many muskox, and it's really the most primordial and alien-looking creature you can see in any wild place. Uh, a species that is flourishing in this part of the Arctic that was once hunted out by whalers just a hundred years ago. Uh, in fact, were, didn't exist in Alaska and they've been reintroduced. But back to the warming of the Arctic. We frequently saw places like this where permafrost ice was exposed. You can just make it out here, just solid walls of ice uh, where the, the banks have sloughed into the river. You can go up and feel this ice, it's rock hard. This is ancient ice. This is left over from the Pleistocene. Uh, and to understand the Arctic, you have to understand the ground underneath you. It's, it's really quite different. And this map from the book, this shows what these uh, five national park units, uh, actually, we were in a preserve at this point. We had passed out of the park in No Attack National Preserve, uh, which has different protections than a park, but it still has this legislated wilderness. It just cannot be developed. Uh, but you can see that they have denoted this uh, red area called talic, which is a Russian word for unfrozen ground amid permafrost areas. And there was no talic. There's no unfrozen ground in all of this region of 50 uh, 60, 70 years ago. But fast forward the clock to the decade of the 2000s, uh, more than a dozen years ago, actually. And this is, it's actually progressed a great deal since then. And you see that in 50 years' time, that this unfrozen ground has spread up into the reaches of the No Attack Preserve and gates of the Arctic National Park, which explains these landslides that we are seeing. It also explains this massive off-gassing, the release of methane uh, from the ice as it melts underneath the ground. This is uh, one of the landslides we saw with the, the river below, and we met up with a scientist. We prearranged a meeting with a, a climate scientist from the University of Alaska, Fairbanks. And this is what this landslide looks like. Huge area that's just... Uh, where the ground is literally collapsed. It's like the inverse of Hawaiian lava flow. It's ice cold instead of burning hot, uh, where the melting permafrost is just bringing all the sludge and the soil off the mountain and silting up the rivers. And here with that climate scientist, we're inspecting that, that thermo, what's called a thermocarst a little bit more carefully. You can see this bulletproof ancient ice here. 
with an explanation for what we're looking at. Located a thermocar site. Thermocars being um, a place where the permafrost is thawing at an accelerating rate and causing erosion on the hillside. It's no accident that this one is south facing because it gets the exposure of the sun from the south, the low angle sun here in Arctic Alaska. As I look behind me, um, I can see the layer of vegetation on top and um, which, and under that what's called the active layer. So that's the layer at the very surface that falls every year during the summer months and below that soil. And below that you see this light gray layer, which is permafrost. That is um, a hard surface. Um, I just threw a rock at it and it, um, and it bounced off of it. So that is, um, that this area has started as a small area that has started to thaw and erode and grown and grown uh, to this area where we have movement of silty mud that's moving into the river um, and growing and it'll do this all the way until things start to freeze again and they continue again next year and get more and more enlarged. These kinds of sites are found throughout the Arctic but they're found um, in greater frequency and broader distribution across the Arctic as a consequence of a warming climate. So this is just one of a cascading series of changes that you can imagine a cold place when you add heat to it. Uh, for instance, the river, uh, these frequent flood events where the river uh, is now flowing over sections of forest. We have to be very careful choosing our route down the river. Massive river and places you couldn't even see the other side of the river. Very difficult route finding. Or in other places, uh, where we saw what is referred to as the drunken forest. And this is where the permafrost has thawed and it's no longer frozen ground. And the trees, the spruce forest here has literally lost its moorings and the trees begin to slump over and eventually they'll fall to the ground. And near the end of the river uh, from this earlier overflight that I did, you can see the, the, the smoke from forest fires in the village of no attack, where the Inupiat have lived for millennia, many millennia, here uh, in the bounty of this wilderness. This river did not used to pile over on these banks like it has now, and it's in danger. It's already wiped out a road, and it's soon likely to take out the airstrip, which is their only source of fu food and fuel from the outside world. But these really are noble and um, thoughtful, gentle people, the Inupiat people. Um, wilderness has a different meaning in Alaska than it does in the lower 48 because man has always been present in wilderness in Alaska. And because of subsistence rights, they are allowed to be in the wilderness. They don't exactly live there, but they frequently hunt in it and depend upon the caribou, whose movements have now radically changed, and they depend upon such things as berry picking. But the berries have changed, too, with the seasons. So how will they continue to adapt as the berries disappear and the caribou decline? Um, it's, we're seeing not only the wilderness change, but the culture uh, there in the Arctic um, being forced to adapt in strange and different ways. So one doesn't have to fly into the remotest stretch of uh, hinterlands of Alaska to find wild country. In northern Minnesota, uh, you may be familiar with a place called the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. It's a place of nearly 2,000 lakes on this side of the border and then maybe several thousand more in another protected Canadian national park. It's a, extraordinarily beautiful place that I've just recently gotten to know from some friends that have been going there all their lives. Sigurd Olson wrote about this place in his book, The Singing Wilderness. You can just make it out here. The way of canoe is the way of the wilderness and of a freedom almost forgotten. Yet another definition of wilderness. Olson was responsible 
more than anyone else, I guess, for the creation of this particular wilderness area. And he explored many of the, uh, what you see, are, these are about 1,200 miles worth of canoe trails. Many of them have portages. Portaging is an essential part of the, the experience in the boundary waters. You've got to carry your canoe to get to the next lake. So I go to wilderness because it offers me the opportunity to be unplugged and stop and contemplate the sunsets or take in the northern lights. The Boundary Waters is one of the best places in the lower 48 to, to witness the aurora borealis. And this is uh, yet another friend, uh, Peter Stock, a renowned transplant surgeon trying to put his finger on what wilderness means to him. Questions. Mm -hmm. What does wilderness mean to you? Happiness. So wilderness is a place that we can also, of course, observe the wildlife photograph it, which is what I like to do. And, and wildlife is one of the sort of essential ingredients, if you will, uh, within the Wilderness Act. These wild areas are, were designed to protect the resources within, including the wildlife. Well, wilderness also comprises the place that we can go to catch our food and procure our meals, such as I learned on a recent trip there with this 35-pound pike, which was much better than the freeze-dried food we were eating. I turned the, the camera back on my good friend Pete Stock to try to get him to better define wilderness as we one of, I, I was telling you that I'm not very descriptive, but wilderness is one of those words like, you know, when they, and this is, the, the analogy is horrible, but it's sort of like, um, you know, with pornography, it's hard to it's hard to define, but you know it when you see it. I think that's the, sort of the same with wilderness. It's hard to define, at least for me, um, but you know it when you see it. Peter, did you beat that charge of pornography? What did you... <laughs> you know it when you see it. Another all-time quote from Terry Stock. No, that's what you know. That well, that's you, what they say. You, you know, and know it when you see it. You don't. Well, not, yeah, it's the famous portrait. Mm. Can't describe it. But you know it, when you see it. Mm. That's what. No, that's how. The, you know, that's what they always say about pornography. When the, it, it's hard to define, but you know it when you see Have it. Have you ever put that in one of your grant applications? No, but. <laughs> I thought it was an appropriate, it's like wilderness, you know? You know it when you see it. Maybe hard to define. I can't tell you how many times I turned my camera on with friends and, and strangers, and I didn't include those interviews, where I asked them what wilderness meant to them, and the answer that I got was to be with my friends. And I, I thought at first that was rather banal of people to say, but then I realized that what they were really, what people were really telling me was that the experience they had with their friends in the wilderness was much more profound and gave them an opportunity to interact with their friends in a way that they couldn't in the real world. So there is yet another reason we go. There in the, the boundary waters, we didn't actually see a wolf there listed as a threatened species several years ago, but recently uh, they've figured there are about 3,000 of them in Minnesota, so they've been taken off uh, that list. Um, and uh, we didn't see any, but we could hear them. So although we couldn't see it, in this case, you know it when you hear it.
It's not only wolves that we heard famously in the Boundary Waters. You hear that beautiful haunting cry of the loon, the call that the great conservation Sigurd Olson called the voice of wilderness. So to conclude, this is one of the more popular national parks, and this shows the, the visitation numbers in Yellowstone in past years. Uh, last year, over 3 million people peaked, uh, I guess, in the year after the pandemic with nearly 5 million people. And just so you're wisely informed about the choices and understand why I prefer wilderness over national parks, I go to one of the most popular wilderness areas, the canoe area, wilderness area in Minnesota. And uh, the biggest year there is 166,000 and change. So the choice to me is clear. Do you want to be in the traffic jam getting into Yellowstone or do you want to go to the Boundary Waters? I'll take the Boundary Waters or the canoe trails and Okefenokee any day. Or I'll take the waterfalls uh, running out of pictured rocks into that oceanic Lake Superior. Or I'll take the Wind River Mountains of Wyoming here over the tallest peak in Wyoming, Gannett Peak, just over 13,000 feet. I wish we had oxygen instead of the door off the plane when I took this picture. But a marvelously glaciated place that I've had the opportunity to visit several times now over the decades. And this time of year, I'll take the trailless headwaters of the Escalante River here in Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument in Utah when the leaves start turning in October, where you can hear the cactus wren singing. So a wilderness is hereby recognized as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. So the question that I ask myself, and perhaps I could leave you with along with what is wilderness to you, is how do we keep it untrammeled? That's all. Thank you.